the devil is real. May God have mercy on us all. First of all, I do have to talk with this film. It is scary. It's going, it is definitely going there. I think Andre has described it as aliens on a boat, um, except for the, you know, happens to be like the aliens that it's Dracula. But exactly. talk about <laughs> you sort of joining in it. Was that sort of the appeal to it, horror in general, or was it maybe what you saw in the character? Oh, it was a little bit of both, uh, to be honest, um, and, and a lot of Andre's vision. Um, first of all, when I read the script, and I know it's been around for a long time, I saw this uh, incredible character in Clemens, an opportunity that I thought was important for us to just go after. You know, you don't have to hit the nail over the head with it, but he's a black man, a black Cambridge educated doctor at the turn of the century. Mm. I think that was important because these men existed. And so part of it was also the research and conversations with Andre and our producers who also wanted to make space for that. And I thought that mm. was great and important, um, especially in the horror genre, because we're not always uh, centered in that way. And it was great to watch this, uh, this, this man who I think is an outsider, who I think is, he represents the other, um, and Dracula represents the other. Also, the woman, the one woman on board, played by Ashling, Anna, she represents the other. And so there's this dynamic there that I thought was just incredible. And then also it's, it's, it's I'm a horror nerd, I'm a horror geek. I never <laughs> picture myself actually like doing it and, and this being my first sort of real sort of leading in this way. Um, uh, Cause I've been a part of some really cool big franchises, but to be a part of bringing Dracula back is, is awesome. And also with my first film, Seeing uh, my first time, time being introduced to a vampire was Blackula in, in the 1970s. Wow. Uh, William Marshall and in, in that black exploitation era. So I just think it's cool to now, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't see it in the 1970s. I saw it you know, when, I was, when I was alive, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but <laughs> the VHS, you know, rocked it to the tape pop. Um, oh, that's the way it goes. You know, but it's one of those things that for me was uh, just incredibly special and uh it's just a great opportunity i think what's so interesting about it too is the fact that it is a dracula movie but you don't even know that's the movie that you're really in until about halfway through it's uh -huh. like it really does take a while to sort of uncover that but one of the things we sort of see from the trailer is at one point you're like we're gonna kill this thing which is obviously like as anyone in a horror movie i'm just like not looking at that guy like this is the guy that's gonna save the day because it seems like a dumb proposition but that's like such a great scene in the movie but as an actor you know like the movie lives or dies by that moment because that is the moment when it's like we fight back set that up for us and just knowing again this is this is why you watch the movie for when they fight back. When they fight back. What the crazy thing is, here's the thing. Clemens is a doctor. He is ill-equipped <laughs> to like, you know, he doesn't even like guns. So it's like, bruh, you gonna do what? You gonna, okay. You know, and that's the great part is like, you get to watch this guy figure that out. He goes from a scientist, a person who believes in science, a doctor to who doesn't believe in the supernatural to a believer to then a hunter. Right, like he becomes that, and he—it's because he has to. It's because he's had to learn to adapt in life, and he—he he grew up on boats, and so he's an underdog. And like you're right, like you watch him in the trailer, you like, here you go, like <laughs> you, you gonna do what? Like we all know how it ends, yeah. bro, <laughs> you know. But yeah. you watch that journey, and that's the thing. This movie pulls the rug out from under you because you know the ending before you think you know the ending, but you don't know that, you know, and so. It sets it up in a really cool way. Uh, and it's just a great uh, device, you know? Um, but that's the thing, he, he, he finds that constitution in himself where everybody on that ship is doubting him and doubting his presence and doubting his existence almost and believing in this other thing. He's like, no, he's wrestling that back and taking that yeah. back. He's facing that evil. And I think that's really, really cool, you know? I mean, it is really cool, but I'm not going to lie to you. I was just thinking of this poor person. But one person that you have with you who I think has the appropriate amount of fear is the character of Anna brought to you by Iceling. Because, like, she really, like, she gives gets this, it. like, she gets it. And like, every one of these stories needs this one person. This is, like, the Ripley character in a lot of ways being like, you do not understand. This is a problem. 
that we, we all need to leave. Listen, women, women been saving our hides for a long time. You know, she's the one, she's the woman on board who is literally telling these men what is right in front of their faces, and they don't want to see it, including Clemens. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, it's 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 just it's 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 his story as old as time, but it's one of those things that that I think makes her such a she's a great actress. I, I mean, Ashling is literally one of my favorite actresses. I was so glad we got to rock together on this film. Um, but you you have this character literally telling you what what it is and reminding us the danger and the horror. But that's the thing. That's the thing that you, they, because hey, here's the other side of it. It's like, she's what she's telling us is like, do you really want, do you really expect me to believe that there's some monster who is calculating this and rationing? Come on, like, yeah. so. You know, you can understand a bit of the skepticism, um, but it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. To a point, but then there's the point where they all have to like get on board. I did want to add this really quick though, before we get out of here is mm -hmm. the fact that you all are like literally She's living in these accents, mm -hmm. right? And you have the same dialect coach as the one from Macbeth. This is like such a different British accent because it has to be period and also of a certain class, but not quite. Like That's talk right. about the dialect. Kate Wilson, I actually work with her at Juilliard as a student, broke college student, like back in the day. She's worked with me on Broadway uh, several times on Broadway um, and also on a couple other films. But then we did Macbeth together, the Shakespeare film. And when they asked me to do Demeter, I was like, we got to bring on Kate, and so Kate worked with all of us on it. And you're right; it's, there is a, there is a, it's period, but it's also there's no recordings of of there's rare recordings from that period from sailors, let alone a black Cambridge educated doctor who, in my backstory, also you know had roots from he grew up on ships, you know, the black community of sailors in Portsmouth or or wherever, you know, so. It's a very specific thing, and we had to work from a lot of different materials and phonetics and and pulling together what this is because I couldn't just listen to you know the Brits now like you know it's a different thing that accent and we might hear that now and say oh well that's different from that so he's not doing it. but it's a very specific calibrated thing and uh, and it was also just a pleasure because as Black American actors we don't also we don't get the opportunity to do that that often fair and, uh, and so I was like you know what I'm gonna run towards it and see what happens and. and yeah. Great job. Getting one back for Idris, as we will say. Uh -huh. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's just, that's just nothing. Thank you so much, Matt Corey. I mean, I've just been doing an American accent and got like since the 90s, practically. Like, that's you say it. Idris? <laughs> Idris, yeah. Oh, he a legend. He, he, he can do his accent, but his American accent better than mine. So, you know, <laughs> he's great. We no longer plot our course. The devil below does. And we all know where he plans to deliver us. To hell, Mr. Clemens. Liam, I'm going to start with you because this is obviously a Dracula. This is a horror story, but your character and your performance, it's a little bit more because you also are narrator to this. So it's like a very intense voice acting performance. I think that's so interesting that your character goes through those various points because he really is what brings us into the story and lets us know that like trouble is afoot. Yes, it's a good point you make. And your audience should know that the reason I'm narrating is because the, the entire movie is based on one chapter in the book, which is the captain's log. Uh, and that's where it, and, and it's very sparse in the book. It's this log where he says one of our guys is missing. There's something malevolent to, on this. So we it was in honor of the book that my narration takes place. The character of, of Elliot, which we have to kind of build from the ground up, is an interesting, he's a decent man. These are merchant seamen, they're blue collar guys who deliver packages and merchandise ar around the world. Um, and they're visited by this horrific beast who treats the ship like his refrigerator. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, th and that's what's, I think that's what's really interesting. These decent men, and there's not a, a wasted character on, on board on this ship. Every, they're, they're all kind of good people. And I think that's what, what's important. You can have whatever monster, monster you want. And as David has said before, and I've said, 
if you don't have people you care about, you're not going to care about the film. And I think you care about these people. Yeah, I was going to say, Woshek, that character is an interesting one because I think uh, on this boat, whenever there's something afoot, there's going to be people that are instant to believe, people are less likely to believe, and most people somewhere in between. But sort of watching your character sort of evolve on his thoughts about the presence was definitely one that was interesting and probably more interesting to you as a character because let's be real this is um it's an ensemble in a lot of ways um and the sense of like you want to have a moment but your character really does like the moment is watching him basically come to the realization that this is really happening because he's the sort of first mate and if this didn't happen he was about to become a captain with the last voyage of the demeter being that it's an ensemble piece and being it there's all these you know different voices and opinions about how stuff works it's like the real world you've got people who are very superstitious you've got people who are like there's a scientific approach to this how are we gonna how are we gonna vanquish this thing that's that's threatening all of our lives and here comes this guy clements this educated man who looks different from me who in my opinion doesn't belong on board a ship who's trying to tell me how to do things and unfortunately Unfortunately, for Wojciech, he's come to find that there is a way you do things. This is how a boat works. This is how life operates. This is who belongs where. Um, my captain, my hero, my mentor is starting to fall apart. People are starting to go missing. The way that I've myopically focused on denying evidence in spite of the fact that it's starting to literally leave puddles of blood on the deck of my ship has been detrimental to the success of Dracula himself. So coming to yeah. that realization and coming to the acceptance of the fact that there is something beyond my understanding that I am powerless over is and was for me as an actor, an incredible thing to tap into. And this might seem like a grand metaphor, but for anyone who's watching who gets the metaphor, for me as a recovering addict and somebody 21 years into recovery, it's so funny how you could be so focused on this is the way this works. None of that BS is, mm -hmm. is, is true. And that's when you're you're most vulnerable. That's when you're, you're most in danger. And I love that I get to go on the journey where I recognize that Clements isn't just my ally. He's actually the guy who has the answers that I never realized I needed. And I find a friend in him before we reach the end of the last voyage of the Demeter. <laughs> yeah, the, the interesting thing about both of you guys in this is that where we start you and where we end you in this story is just so different and watching these characters, and that's for every character in this, not just yes. your two, everyone yes. is in a different place. But the one thing that's sort of centered is it is your dedication to the Demeter, your pair of dedication to the ship, to its crew, to various degrees. So Liam, I'll start with you. They really sort of embody the idea of like, there's something here to protect. Like they are the people that are like, we have to, to to stay the course. And it's almost because of their love of sailing that makes it to where, again, it's it's part of the engine as it will the plot. The fact that they're like, we've been through harder times. Yeah, very much so. You have to remember that people that do difficult jobs like that, that leave their families and go off military people, that, uh, you know, people in all sorts of walks of life, they find a comfort in those people they work with, that they live with 24 hours a day. They have to get on. It is their family. It's their second family. In some cases, it's their only family. And Wojciech is, is, is like that. And with Elliot, he's come to the end of that journey at the beginning of the movie and is handing over the reins to this their home, to Wojciech, which is obviously before we come across our friend uh, who's coming out to, <laughs> to, uh, to destroy all that. So the, the setup for this drama is magnificent. And when he does show up, this is not the Dracula that we've seen many, many times. This is not a, a seducer in a cape, you know, yeah. an attractive man who's mysterious and somehow magnetic. Um, what we have is a force of nature, a beast, um, a malevolent, amoral animal who's after these mm. unfortunate, decent men. And I think that makes for seriously good drama. Uh, one of the things I think is also really interesting is the way that uh, Andre has done Dracula. He brought back his collaborator, Javier, who, uh, again, embodies the monster on set. I, he definitely talked about how it makes it more real. David, I, I have to ask you, because you do get to do a lot of sort of like the body acting with this version of Dracula. That is not something where you really have to act too hard, I would imagine. 
It's such a gift. It's so cool. I'm a kid who grew up addicted to monster movies. My earliest heroes in cinema were Lon Chaney, who would vanish into the makeup of his work. Bella Lugosi, obviously, is a great Dracula, but look at Boris Karloff and how he vanished into Frankenstein's monster. So seeing Javier, who I've admired his work, I'm a big fan already, become Dracula. Mm -hmm. And the work that you're in and the rest of the makeup effects team did craft this Nosferatu come vampire bat come demon uh, look with, with Andre was so cool. And it's dimly lit. We're in the, the hold of a ship. A lot of my battling with Dracula is taking place under the deck or late at night. And so he's moving in the shadows and the way that guy uses his body and has such a control over his instrument is... Ooh, Man, yeah, I was scared. <laughs> I would only, I would only imagine. All right, real quick before I get out of here, favorite Dracula that you've gotten to see, Liam, David, real quick. Oh, with me, it's a bit like the James Bond thing. You know, Sean Connery was my James Bond. Christopher Lee was my Dracula until I came across Javier. Ah. It's now Javier. What about you, David? I'm gonna go. I love Chris Lee. He's a hero to me. But I've got Bella on my socks today, so Bella Lugosi. We'll go back to Bella. Christopher Lee's my very close, but Bella Lugosi. Liam can have Chris, and I'll take Bella. He is here, Mr. Clements. The thing that wears the skin of a man. In the night, it drinks our blood, and he is on this ship, which means that we will never leave it. I heard you describe this as basically alien on a ship. Was that sort of like something that really just intrigued you about the story to begin with? Like talk about your history and how you sort of started with the project. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's when I read the script, which I was lucky enough to even read. And then it was definitely the uh, this idea of creating, uh, to portray Dracula in a way you've never seen him before as this monster on a ship, you know, in story terms, it's kind of like alien. Yeah, you're out on the ship. There is nothing around. You cannot escape. You know, it's a blueprint in a way for creating tension and for creating contained environment to create a, you know, a horror movie. I just wanted to make the scariest Dracula movie I've seen. That, that was my goal. Yeah, and that's so funny too, because you wanted to make the scariest Dracula movie, but then you also were not really like married to one version of Dracula, as it were. We see like various iterations. Was that also something from like the early days of this script? Because we really do see a metamorphosis of even what we call Dracula in this movie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a way, he is a sophisticated aristocrat, you know, because that's what he is in in uh, in Romania. That's what he is in London. But I think we had to focus on on just a monster aspect of him and tell this journey of this old fragile man who has gotten himself into a, a journey he wasn't in a way maybe quite prepared for and he's in dire trouble when uh, mm. when he loses his blood supply Anna and he has to start attacking the crew to survive yeah. but then at some point he does gain the powers he he does become the demonic force of nature that he is and um, and then he ends up you know becoming the ultimate version of Dracula, yeah. I think it's so interesting too, because throughout these um, various iterations, you're back with Javier, and I, I dare to say this, and I know this is like uh, a lot of comparisons considering that you produce scary stories, Tell the Dark with Guillermo del Toro, but I see a pairing of you and Javier that could be as similar of his with Doug Jones, like just this idea of like creature performers following you know, these monster creators throughout films. Is that something that sort of intrigues you as well? Javier would be at the top of my mind any movie that I had. <laughs> but also not just as a creature performer. He's a great actor. I mean, he's a really great actor. Mm. What do you think that he brings particularly to these performances that, that really sort of shines out in the Dracula? I mean, he has a nuance about his body movement and he has, a, obviously his look is very, is very unique. He thinks like the character, he behaves like the character, he really lives the character on screen. When you're working with him on set and when he's portraying take by take by take, he gives you sometimes surprising choices that he comes up with on the spot that you can film for a couple of minutes maybe uh, and actually do seven, eight takes on a go in a go without breaking mm. the camera. And he would just give you versions and versions of how Dracula could behave. And it's um, because he has all these things in his mind and in his body and his knowledge of what a creature can, what he can do with his body is also totally unique. So 
I think it must be interesting too for the scene partners. I mean, look, Corey, Aisling, like everyone um, in this production for the most part has, they, they're very seasoned performers. And so they've definitely seen folks doing creature performances. They've seen heavy makeup uh, performances. Did you have any of them remark about how different it is? Because it is very different when you have it the way you have it on set here, where like literally he is just the monster. There's not like a character that you're really interacting with, but it almost makes it like you can really suspend disbelief if you want to. Yeah, and I remember when we were shooting the scene when Woody gets bitten, we didn't want, and Woody didn't want to see, didn't want to see Javier. He had mapped him many times, but he didn't mm -hmm. want to see him in costume until the camera was rolling. So we were literally keeping him off the set while we start the camera rolling and Woody doesn't know what is he's facing. And then he walks in out of the shadows on, you know, when it's happening on camera to capture his reaction in a proper way. And the fear he has in his eyes when he sees him the first time. And it's just, uh, it was a way to, to make it all work. Yeah. And Woody, um, who plays Toby, the young boy in this one, correct? And he's like, I think folks will recognize him from Monk Mon and other kind of stuff. But I think it's so interesting because this film, like, I'll just put it, they, they, you guys are pulling no punches, right? Is that correct? Like, you guys are really, I would just say that, that if this is going about making the scariest Dracula movie, you're taking the scariest sort of like elements from everything that they've mentioned before and really sort of going for it. Was that also something that you really had to, because I'll I just put it this way. This is not scary stories to tell in the dark. This is not a teen, <laughs> like this is a hard R scary movie. And you guys really lean into that. Yeah, no, I mean, I was so happy that everyone embraced the deaths in the movie because there are a couple of ones that I'm sure is going to be talked about maybe, you know, at least yes. reacted to. And yeah, I that's think, very true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I think, uh, but I, I think that's, you know, we have to portray things in the way we believe is the best story. You know, it's. Uh... Mm. I, I really do think, again, this is going to get folks talking about it. The thing I just want to, you know, make sure that I say uh, before we get out of here is this idea that you have in horror great collaborators. It's such a collaborative filmmaking process, but the best part is talking to other horror heads about it. And this again, is gonna be a movie that's gonna get people talking. One person that you probably talked about with this one was Guillermo del Toro, who I know sort of like recommended you for this project. Talk a little bit about like just a filmmaker to filmmaker, any conversations you had with him about this? I mean, very little. He got so busy with, with Nightmare Alley <laughs> around the time, I, by the time I got into this. But it was, uh, you know, he's been, a, yes, he's been very supportive and he recommended me and it was all, uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have been making it without his recommendations. So, you know, I'm in great depth to him for sure. Have you gotten a chance to let him see it yet? No, and I'm looking forward to that, actually. I hope okay. he, you know, I, I'm also scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Fair enough. Actually, fair enough. Thank you so much, Andre.